Hello, my name is Victor Pinto, and today I'm going to be talking about my current project using deep learning to forecast ground magnetic field perturbations at mid latitudes considering MLT dependence. I want to start by thanking my collaborators and the whole magician team. This talk will also have a live session on January 10th, so feel free to bring your questions and comments. The motivation of our research project comes from the need to understand and anticipate or predict geomagnetically induced currents. GICs are, as the name indicates, currents that are induced in conductors and electrical systems as a result of disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. Such disturbances in the field are driven by extreme solar activity, generally associated with geomagnetic storms. There is, of course, a practical aspect to GICs as enhanced currents running through conductors can reduce the lifetime of pipes and tracks by increasing corrosion and in some cases in, in some extreme cases can lead to overload in power lines and even malfunctions of the electric, electrical distribution systems. So GICs are a complex problem. Their occurrence depends on the solar wind strength, the magnetospheric response, the propagation of those disturbances through the ionosphere and into the ground, the location this is latitude, longitude, the effect of conductivity on the ground, and the particularities of each of the systems being affected, including this orientation, uh, length, among others. This talk is about one aspect of the whole GIC process. Our objective, which is the forecasting of ground magnetic field perturbations, in particular the horizontal component of the ground magnetic field, is a quantity that, for better or worse, is used commonly as a proxy of GIC occurrence and is a reasonable first step for any GIC model. Of course, the modeling of ground magnetic field perturbations is hardly a new topic and in fact the research and this particular talk is inspired by the GEM modeling challenge that took place almost a decade ago and that culminated with the evaluation and selection of an operational model. And Pulkinen et al. 2013 offers a great starting point for any attempt of forecasting the ground magnetic field perturbations, as they establish a series of metrics to compare, as well as some recommendations for events to use of testing. So, why machine learning? There are a good number of reasons, starting from things that we have known for a long time, such as that we're trying to make predictions over a driven system where causality is relatively well established, and the fact that historical and real-time dataset exist which is a key element for the success of machine learning algorithms. Naturally, the computational advances of the past years allow us to train complex models with uh, relatively modest machines, and thanks to that, we can iterate quickly. Maybe more importantly, the availability of tools, when, in, in this case, at uh, this statement, everyone else is doing machine learning, can be taken in a very positive way, as it is thanks to that, that new and better algorithms have been developed many of which can be directly applied to our kind of problem. So a simple way to look at our problem is that we plan to use only measurements available at the L1 Lagrangian point to predict perturbations down the air, while somewhat ignoring the rest of the system. Naturally, this approach reduced in principle the opportunities to maximize the accuracy of the predictions, but allows for predictions to have a lead time of nearly half an hour, effectively forecasting half an hour ahead. The current project is also a continuation of a work we published last year. Many details about the implementation of the model that I'll be discussing here can be found in our Frontiers paper. The idea remains the same, forecasting of ground magnetic field horizontal component, but instead of using only the Ottawa station as we did in there, we will be expanding to many mid and high latitude stations. As mentioned, we are only using parameters directly measured in the solar wind, although we are not using real-time data but data processes in the Omni data set. We're going to be discussing a feedforward neural network model, and we will evaluate our models as a regression problem and as, as a classification problem also with several thresholds. Uh, many of those are actually described in Purkinen et al. 2013. So for this study, we use mid and high latitude stations described first in the GEM challenge. Out of the 13 stations corresponding to 12 locations they use, will be only using 10 to evaluate. This reduction is simply technical in nature. We'll be paying attention in particular to the mid-latitude stations marked in green and to the high-latitude stations marked in purple. 
As data sets, we have used Omni data from 1995 through 2017. In this case, we train our network using IMFB, BC, solar wind speed, density, pressure, and electric field. The selection of parameters was done based on the findings by, by LOTS et al. in 2015 and our own previous results. For each parameter, we decided to include the time history of the previous 40 minutes of measurements in order to have a time-dependent neural network. For the ground magnetic perturbations, we have used baseline removed supermax data. MLT and latitude have been used as training features, and from the N and E components, we have created our target parameters. We implemented a feedforward neural network using the Keras TensorFlow framework in Python. The network is itself is a fully connected four layers ANN with 320 nodes in the first hidden layer and then half the nodes in each subsequent layer. The final layer is connected to a single output node and a dropout rate of 0.2 has been imposed between the first two hidden layers as a regularization to reduce overfitting. Uh, in this case, we use a train test split that was, sequ uh, that was sequential to 70 to 30, and the loss function we minimize is mean square error. So we have considered different ways to forecast dbh dt. The simplest way is to directly calculate it from dbe and dbn dt, and to try to forecast that. Other methods involve forecasting dbe. E D T and DBN DT and then construct DBH DD out of the individually predicted quantities. Uh, and similarly, we can predict N and E separately and then try construct DBH DT there. So in addition to training the model using all the available data, we have also trained the model using only storm time data. And we'll briefly discuss the implications of using these two different training data sets. Although hyperparameter tuning is also important, we'll only mention and briefly discuss different results associated to the choice of a particular scalar. And finally, our validation data set will be seven storms, five out of the six storms originally proposed by Pukin et al. and two proposed by Welling et al. in 2018. Uh, we have excluded the 2003 storm from the validation list, as that being the most extreme storm in the training data set, it is unlikely that a neural network model will be able to predict it and will rather have it as part of the training set. So this figure presents the root mean square error to the left and the correlation coefficient to the right of the test sets for the models trained for each station, a range from lower to higher latitude from left to right. Here, the training model that uses all the available data set that is now shown in purple and the model that uses only storm time data is shown in green. The different shade colors indicate the variation in the scalar for each model. As we don't have baseline numbers to compare with and to determine whether the numbers are good or bad, the main takes from this figure is to show how the RMSE is directly tied to the latitude of the station. Naturally, stations at higher latitude present larger variations in the ground magnetic field, and that shows clearly in the left panel. Moreover, by reducing the training data to storm time only, the RMSE increases for all stations, which is expected as we are keeping the most active time only for the training. Although the left panel shows nothing more than what we would expect of this physical system, the right panel shows that at least for the test set, there is a consistency in the correlation coefficients of the predictions across all stations and across all different models, with only a few exceptions indic indicating that the set of solar wind parameters used for the training seems to be at least similarly good or bad across most latitudes. Now we move to the validation data set. <coughs> we see, fortunately, a similar panorama. Root mean square error increases with latitude in general, although it does differently for different storms. Correlation coefficient presents a similar trend than in the previous figure, remaining relatively constant across stations for every individual storm, and with most storms presenting a value slightly above or below 0.5. In both the test and the validation datasets, there seems to be a clear decrease in correlation for the high-latitude stations compared to the mid-latitude stations, 
which may be consistent with claims that at high latitude auroral processes and in general local processes may be more important than the global drive of the solar wind. So what we're looking here is a single storm, the event that occurred on July 22, 2004, and the figure shows again root mean square error and correlation for all four different models that we are comparing. What is interesting from this figure is that unlike in the test data set, for the validation data set, the RMSC of the model that uses all available data set and the model that uses storm time data set are now very similar, with storm time only events being even lower for some stations. For the correlation coefficient, storm time only presents a higher correlation coefficient. <coughs> The result, while not terribly surprising, is still interesting as it reminds us of how unbalanced is the original data set, with most of the time having little to no variation in the ground magnetic field and with only few events possibly leading to GIC-like variations. So, what if we look at the actual predictions for the July 22, 2004 event? The left panel shows the mid-latitude stations of Wings, Newport and Ottawa, and the right panels the high-latitude stations of Abisco and Yellowknife, with blue being the real data and red the predicted data. While the quality of the prediction is hard to evaluate in plots like this, the model generally underestimates the variations in DBHDT. Still, most models seem to capture the essence of the disturbed periods and reproduce some of the variability in the ground magnetic field. Importantly, as these neural networks don't use the time history of the ground magnetometers, there is no fear of the model following the measurements with a delay, which is a common problem seen in recurrent neural network approaches. That can be clearly appreciated in the Newport station and in the Yellowknife stations, where the predictions between July 27 and July 28 marked between the green bars are still consistent with the fluctuations seen in other stations of similar latitude even though there are no in-situ measurements. So another evaluation metric described in Putkin et al. 2013 was the transformation of the modeling from regression to classification. This was done by considering windows of 20 minutes and registering the maximum value of DBHDT, both real and predicted. After that, a set of thresholds were established at 18, 42, 60, and 90 nanoteslas per minute, and the model was evaluated on whether the real values crossed those thresholds or not, and of course whether the model could predict those crossings. This figure shows exactly the same plots as in the previous slide, but transformed into the 20 minute classification problem. Note that the general fluctuations remain the same and that the transformation allows for even a clearer comparison. To evaluate, four metrics were used. Probability of detection, this is whether the prediction was made properly when the real data crosses a threshold, probability of false detection, when the prediction crosses a threshold and the, 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 the data don't, probability of correct, which is basically shows whether a real and predicted value are in the same threshold range or not, and the high key skill score, which represents how much better of or worse than random the model is predicting. In the case of our event, probability of detections is reasonably high for the lowest threshold at high latitudes and relatively low for lower thresholds. It is important to note though that at lower latitudes the fact that there are very little crossings affect this score significantly. Probability of false detection is low across the board for similar reasons, but also because the models tend to underestimate. Probability of correct essentially confirms that for this particular storm no threshold crossings occurred at the low latitude stations. And finally, the height key skill core indicates that although the predictions are not terribly good at the moment, mid-latitude stations seem to respond better than high-latitude stations to the model. To summarize, we presented an overview of our current modeling of ground magnetic field perturbations at different latitudes using a feedforward neural network with time dependence built in. We evaluate our models on seven different storms and got consistent correlations in the range of 0.4 to 0.6 for more stations although we got worse results at high latitude stations. The models clearly underestimate the magnitude of the fluctuations, but in general seem to follow the correct trends, which is encouraging. The evaluation of the models as a classification problem results in moderate but positive skill scores for the single storm presented. And to wrap it up, we expect to present in the future a more complete analysis of the different models that we have used and comparisons with existing models, which can be done 
in the limited time available. Thank you for your attention.